And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Spinophorosaurus, which was a request from Morgan via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. Spinophorosaurus was a basal sauropod that lived in the Middle Jurassic in what is now Niger. And it looked like other sauropods. It was bulky with a long neck and tail and on four legs. It had a somewhat upright posture, though. Three specimens have been found, and it's one of the most complete known basal sauropods. As a subadult, it was estimated to be about 43 feet or 13 meters long, and the paratype was estimated to be about 46 feet or 14 meters long. It's also estimated to weigh about 7 metric tons. Spinophorosaurus had a short, deep, broad brain case and spatulate or spoon-shaped teeth, as well as 13 neck vertebrae. Its neck vertebrae was similar to Jobaria and Cetiosaurus. It had small air-filled internal chambers in the dorsal vertebrae, also known as the back vertebrae. And it's interesting because air sacs are known in much later sauropods. Hmm. Because this one's only from the middle Jurassic. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's a basal sauropod. It had a rigid spine and neural spines that were wrinkled, as well as a robust pelvis and a strong, rigid tail. And that tail had more than 37 caudal vertebrae. You don't often hear a sauropod tails described as, as rigid. Yeah, that's, that's true. It's pretty unusual. The chevrons in the front of the tail were blade-like, and the chevrons in the back of the tail were rod-like. Now, originally, it was thought that Spinophorosaurus had spiked osteoderms at the end of the tail. And they thought, well, this right supposed osteoderm was larger than the left one and a little bit different in shape, so they probably didn't form a pair. These tail spikes, when they were thought to be spikes, were thought to be large and bony near the end of the tail and arranged in a similar way to Shunosaurus. That's a sauropod that lived around the same time in what is now China. And does have some pretty cool tail weaponry. Yes. Then in 2012, Emanuel Schopp and others found that the tail spikes were somewhat L-shaped and more like the L-shaped bones found in the Howe Quarry in the Morrison Formation than the tail spikes of Shunosaurus. They also weren't as wrinkled or rugose compared to other dinosaurs' osteoderms. And the L-shaped elements of Spinophorosaurus were a bit broader than the L-shaped elements found in the Howe Quarry, and they had a triangular outline. They also found broken edges, so it's possible that, you know, they originally they didn't think they came in a pair, but maybe this was a pair that came in the same size. Mm, and one of them just broke more than the other? Yeah. But last, these were found below the scapula, the shoulder blade. So they suggested that instead of tail spikes, these were clavicles. Mm. So <laughs> there's a big difference between a, a tail spike and a shoulder bone or a collarbone. Yes. The type species is Spinophorosaurus nigerensis. It was described in 2009 by Christian Rems and others, and the genus name means spine-bearing lizard. That's based on what was thought to be those spiked osteoderms on the end of the tail that are now thought to be clavicles. And the species name refers to the Republic of Niger. A couple individuals were collected in 2006 and 2007 at the rural community of Adarbizanat, and a juvenile was also later assigned to Spinophorosaurus. A lot of dinosaurs were found in Niger in the 1960s and 1970s, and Palsarino excavated there between 1999 and 2003 and found Jobaria and Afrovenator, or Afrovenator. In 2003, the Paldas Project, Paleontology and Development, excavated the area with the goal of combining paleontological research with a developmental program, The idea was to improve infrastructure, education, and promote tourism. In 2005, Ulrich Yoger and Edgar Sommer were exploring the area, and locals told them about some large bones in a new locality. They found a rounded bone tip coming out of the surface, and that turned out to be a complete femur of the holotype of Spinophorosaurus. Nice. Yeah. They also found a shoulder blade and a vertebra. These fossils were found in hard, brittle siltstone and then removed with light blows from hammers. They worked with more of the local people and found most of that specimen in two days, and it was mostly complete. It's in a death pose. And in a photograph of that holotype at the dig site, it looks like those fossil 
digs that you see at museums where you brush away the dirt and there's mm -hmm. a nearly complete dinosaur. It's crazy. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it sounded like when you're describing the rock that it was brittle. Mm -hmm. that you, what you want is a brittle rock and a not brittle <laughs> fossil underneath it. So if that's the case, yeah, you could remove a lot of the rock in the field, which would be handy. Yeah, it looks really cool. Now, they didn't have the right equipment or permits at the time, so they covered the fossil with debris to protect it, and then they went back to Germany with plans to do a full excavation via the Braunschweig Museum. They got a permit in 2006, and the plan was that in exchange for excavating, the museum would build a new school in the area. Oh, that's a nice exchange. Yeah. They also got sponsors, and this project was called Project Dino. Now, around the same time, the Paldez team from Spain was also working in the area. The mayor of Aderbizanat, Mohamed Eshika, had given the team from Spain permission to excavate the skeleton that Yoga and Somer had been working on. And that skeleton, the holotype, ended up being shipped to Spain without the German team knowing. When they went back, they found an empty dig site. Oh, geez. After they had left it there and excavated most of it? Yeah. Oh, boy. The German team, they did end up finding the paratype specimen, however, so it wasn't a completely wasted trip. And that was a really difficult excavation. There wasn't enough water. Some people who were helping to dig fainted. Temperatures got to 109 to 113 degrees Fahrenheit or 43 to 45 degrees Celsius. Ugh. I'd rather be in Greenland. <laughs> <laughs> and they said after nearly a week, all but two of the people on their team were sick with diarrhea and circulation problems. Oh, boy. There's just... There wasn't much shade when they were digging either. And there were a few sandstorms that were described as peeling their skin. Oh, everything about this sounds terrible. <laughs> so their team, they finished on April 3rd. And then Ashika told them about what happened to that first skeleton that went to Spain. And to make up for it, he led them to another fossil site where they found the back end of possibly a Jobaria skeleton. But they had to leave that in the field until the next season. And the... <sighs> team from Spain canceled their plans to excavate for that season after the outbreak of the Tuareg Rebellion from 2007 to 2009. So the Spanish team didn't swoop them again? Yes. <laughs> but the Germans went back. They worked together with the local community that was comprised of people of various cultures, the Tuareg, Hausa, and Fulani people. And the dig was organized by a local Tuareg partner, Ahmed Bahani, and Tuareg chief and mayor of the village, Mohamed Eshika. This dig happened during a civil war. They were protected by the mayor, Mohamed Eshika, and the army. Wow. It's yeah. like the uh, Bone Wars, some of those. A little bit, yeah. There were also snakes and scorpions and monitor lizards that they came across while digging. One person on site, they said, was a herpetologist, so they knew what to do if they were bitten by a venomous snake. <laughs> they could ID the venomous ones, too. Yeah. yeah. And then at night, they used flashlights and went snake hunting. Oh, geez. I guess it's better to be on the offensive with snakes. At night, they're a little slow, too. Yeah. <laughs> Get them out of the area. <laughs> While digging, they also found petrified wood, conifers, crocodile teeth, and fish scales. So when Spinophorosaurus lived, this area was swampy and wet. Both the German and Spanish teams ended up working together to describe Spinophorosaurus. Oh, cool. Yeah. It took about two and a half years to prepare the paratype. The paratype was about 70% complete, so then the holotype helped fill in the missing pieces. And between those two specimens, most of the bones are known, although no forearms or hands have been found. The holotype includes a brain case, parts of the skull, and most of the skeleton, and the paratype includes a partial skull and incomplete skeleton. The specimens are managed by the Musée National d'Histoire Naturelle in Niger, and they were returned after being on exhibit briefly, and then they 3D printed the skeleton. So the specimens are back in Niger. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. That's great. Hopefully next time they find a dinosaur there, there'll be some local paleontologists who can work on it too. Yeah, it does sound like paleontology has gotten bigger there. Spinophorosaurus was the first sauropod to have its skeleton 3D printed. Oh, that's a fun claim to fame. Yeah. In 2012, Adrian Paramo and Francisco Ortega described a small sauropod that was found near the two Spinophorosaurus specimens. This one had 14 vertebrae, including all the neck vertebrae and some back vertebrae. And they were smaller compared to the other specimens. And there were also parts that weren't fused. So that one is considered to be a juvenile Spinophorosaurus. Maybe they were living in herds. 
<laughs> there were also dinosaur tracks found near the Spinophorosaurus skeletons, including six footprints from a medium-sized sauropod and 120 two-toed theropod footprints, possibly by swimming theropods, which may be why one toe didn't leave a mark. Hmm. Unless it's a raptor. They leave two-toed tracks as well. Hmm. There's a lot of similarities between Spinophorosaurus and Middle Jurassic Eurasian sauropods like Shunosaurus, as well as Mementosaurids. There's similarities in the vertebrae and humerus. And there's a lot of differences between Spinophorosaurus and Lower and Middle Jurassic South Gondwanan sauropods based on the shape of the neural spines, humerus, and vertebrae. And those would have been the ones that were closer. So this is another one of those where it's more closely related to the Eurasian ones while it's in Africa and less closely related to the African ones, even though that's where it is. Yes, exactly. So Spinophorosaurus helps show that features thought to be in derived sauropods that were found in a East Asia are more like ancestral traits or plesiomorphic in eusauropods. So there may be a connection between sauropods from the Jurassic and what's now North Africa, Europe, and East Asia. And then important sauropod development may have happened in what is now North Africa. And where Spinophorosaurus lived, that area was near the equator and wet in the summer and had lots of plants. Much less surprising place to find a sauropod than Greenland. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or sauropodomorph, I should say. In 2012, Fabian Knoll and others looked at the brain case of Spinophorosaurus, and they found it didn't have reduced vestibular apparatuses, these sensory apparatus in the inner ear, which may mean it was more important for Spinophorosaurus to have vision and coordinate its movements between the eyes, head, and neck. In 2018, Benjamin Gentin Sashino and others reported a probable pathology in Spinophorosaurus due to injury, and they found that Spinophorosaurus had fast-growing bone tissue. In 2015, Vidal and others made a 3D model to study how Spinophorosaurus moved and found it couldn't move its tail much. It had these overlapping chevrons like dromaeosaurs and ankylosaurs. That's that weird rigid tail. Yeah, that's so strange. You always think of sauropods as bending their necks a lot, and then usually the tail would bend to sort of help counterbalance or sometimes be used as a weapon. There's lots of reasons to have a flexible tail. Mm -hmm. It seems like there's a lot of good reasons when you're that big to have a rigid tail. <laughs> but there must have been something, some reason. <laughs> yeah. In 2020, Daniel Vidal and others looked at similarities between giraffe and sauropod necks as they grew up. And they looked at the specimens of Spinophorosaurus because they're from different ages, as well as an adult and newborn giraffe, and they CT scanned all the bones. And they found that both Spinophorosaurus and giraffes get more flexible necks as they grow. Ah, it's the opposite of me. I've been getting less and less flexible the more I've grown. <laughs> well, you're not a giraffe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be nice. They found that a subadult Spinophorosaurus could move its neck more than Platysaurus and other previously analyzed sauropods, quote, enabling its neck to engage in many different postures unattainable by other sauropods, end quote. So its neck got more flexible as it grew, but its tail was just rigid the whole time. Strange. Yeah. They found Spinophorosaurus was probably a high browser, like giraffes, that's based on the relatively long humerus and narrow snout, and had an overall range of motion similar to a giraffe. But they found that Spinophorosaurus was as flexible in the neck as a giraffe because it had almost twice the number of neck vertebrae compared to a giraffe. So there's not as much flexibility in between the vertebrae compared to a giraffe, but it had so many that it, the whole neck was still flexible. Nice. Yeah, it's always surprising how few vertebrae giraffes have in their neck, mm -hmm. <laughs> considering how flexible they are. <laughs> and based on the Spinophorosaurus skeleton, it could probably, quote, browse on vegetation at nearly three times the height of its shoulders. Wow, that is really Brachiosaurus or giraffe titan like or yes. giraffe-like. Yes, and to drink water, it would have needed to splay like a giraffe. <laughs> I guess that helps explain maybe that could be why its tail would be more rigid if it's got more of an upright posture and the tail sort of going down behind it. Mm -hmm. It's not all that useful. It might not be as long and all that. So True. Now they found Spinophorosaurus to have a more vertical posture than previously thought with its tall shoulders and an elevated neck that was well above shoulder level. And that's based partially on having this 20-degree wedged sacrum, the vertebrae between the hips. Mm. Yeah, the idea being the angle of the back 
tells you something about the angle of the feeding posture, I suppose. Yeah. So Spinophorosaurus's snout was about 16.4 feet or 5 meters above the ground. A post on SV Pow agreed with Vidal and others about their reconstruction and how Spinophorosaurus had wedged sacrum, so it had a more inclined torso and neck. That means that the tail and torso are not parallel with each other. However, it also mentioned that the bones are not enough to show how vertebrae articulated, and models need to incorporate intervertebral cartilage, Mm -hmm. which Vidal and others mentioned but said that since we don't really know how much cartilage there was, it's likely we won't ever know. We have seen, we saw some stuff at SVP last year, though, of ways that you can recreate the cartilage in between vertebrae by looking at specific features of the bone. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, you know, now that it's been a few years, maybe someone can look back at it and yeah, iron it out. This is a seems to be a popular dinosaur to study. There's a mm-hmm. lot of studies on it already. In 2018, Vidal and others tested hypothetical mating postures to see if Spinophorosaurus performed a cloacal kiss, backwards mating, or if the male mounted from behind. And they found that the male could mount the female from behind while resting its front legs on the back. The tail was flexible enough to get out of the way, but it couldn't perform a cloacal kiss unless they did backwards mating, where they approach each other backwards and have their tail flexed sideways. Oh, interesting. Okay, so like one reverses into the other one? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. That's cumbersome, but I guess sauropods are cumbersome creatures. I guess, yeah. There's a model of Spinophorosaurus outside the Braunschweig Museum, and that's nicknamed Namu after the museum's name. So you can see a, a Spinophorosaurus there. For those of you who listen to our Dinosaur of the Day segment and you like it, please consider becoming a patron. We take new Dinosaur of the Day requests from our patrons and offer a bunch of other perks as well. So check out our page at patreon.com slash or click the link on the left. <laughs> 